to us, to our friendship, to our agency, to another year. There was a certain point in time where we sort of became the fair-haired boy in terms of we were their hit. Hi, I'm Madeline Hayes, and this is David Addison. Right. And we'd just like to take a minute or two before the show starts to welcome you back to another season of Moonlighting. I wasn't much interested in doing doing 22 of anything. If I couldn't do them well, I was much more interested in doing what I did well. I had figured out sort of the dirty secret of television at that moment, which was enormous profits were being made. So some of that could certainly be plowed back into the making of the show. This was basically a network show. So we did things both from, a, I think, from a financial standpoint that uh, most episodic shows couldn't do. We'd have these execs just hawking, hawking the hell out of Glenn. All they're worried about, the execs are worried about the numbers, the money. I, I remember giving this lecture to the executives at ABC, you know, because they were very upset we were spending all this, until the show became an enormous hit, which it did fairly quickly, but you know, we were spending all this money, and I said, but here's the thing, I said, you, you'll spend all this money on our show, but you can run it three and four times, and it'll still get a 30 share, and it did. I said, because there's so many jokes buried in it, you really need to watch it two or three times. It's like a Marx Brothers movie in the sense of the density of the jokes. And I really thought this made sense as an argument. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would say it to anybody who would listen. Why should all television shows cost the same amount of money? Why should... Why should they... Because back then, that was the thing. If it was an hour, we pay you this much money to make the show. And I thought that was asinine. Our show costs more, and what's the problem? The thing that they really had the most problem with was we weren't able to meet all our air dates. And I think there was more pressure about that than there was about the financial. I think if they had to choose between spend more money and get it on the air, they would have spent more money. Uh, the show aired on Tuesday night. And on one or two occasions, I remember coming in at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and shooting a scene, or even two small scenes, for that episode that aired that night. The story was that um, one week, I believe, we made the satellite feed by a half hour. A lot of times, because we were so late, they would literally beam the show wet to, to the East Coast, and we would get away with a lot of stuff that at the time was pretty risque for TV. Get your hand off my behind. Is that your behind? Is that my hand? You know, that's what I like about this place. You learn something new every day. But you get serious. Maddie, I just have my hand on your behind. If I get any more serious, you're going to move us to cable. Sometimes uh, th there'd be delays in scripts and stuff like that. But as long as you kept going, ABC uh, it never seemed to really bug us about... Um, as long as we got the show done, it was okay, because the show was breaking new ground at the time. It was really, really breaking new ground. I've, I've been in downtown Los Angeles in a location where the script supervisor was on the telephone with Glenn in longhand writing down the scene, writing down the dialogue, and then would take it and I think we had a, a copy machine at least on the truck, copy some of those pages and hand them out to the crew and hand them out to the cast and they'd learn the scene and we'd go shoot it. We were always behind schedule because we were shooting it really like a film and um, we so the way we would try to catch up time was the car shots <laughs> mom will you read me a story before I go to bed I mean if you look at the driving stuff if you really want to look at them closely and have fun with them watch how bad a job they both do of pretending to drive because they're so caught up in the scene and, and it was a nightmare in the editing room because they're not driving and when you got the performances that we did, the last thing you want to do is give them a note of, let's go back and do the scene again, but drive better. I mean, it's just a dumb note. A lot of times we did have the script pasted across the dashboard so you couldn't see it. <laughs> she never saw us reading it, though. Sad to think that an innocent person had to die just because she fell for the wrong guy. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. There's a page missing out of my copy of the script. Classic moonlighting. Just make make fun of ourselves before somebody else can. As a little girl, you were more of a door slammer, like your father. Still am. And the slamming doors. The slamming doors was something that um, we had to rebuild the doors every season because I would slam them so hard. Of course I'll step into your office. The thing that I loved most, I think, about working on Moonlighting is that 
if we wrote a joke and let's say 20 million people were watching the show and it's like you'd think okay 12 million people will get this joke but 8 million won't Glenn would say it's great throw it out let's you know let's do it let's put it in when I worked on other shows it's like you know not everyone's gonna get it so we can't use it and I think that's why it was so so much fun and you know we just we just wrote everything we could think of but that was all Glenn's doing I mean Glenn created the atmosphere Glenn created the mold and, and he said something that that no one ever said in the sitcom uh, to us which is what's the truth of the scene emotionally what's what what's it about and and things like people don't care how you figured out who was the murderer they care about what's going on between David and Maddie that was the truth of the scene that was that was a revelation to us and that was something we took to heart then and, and ever since uh, anybody could have an idea there was no real ego nobody had an ego it's you know this is my my show or you know that's was another great thing about Jay and and Glenn working in the writing room at the beginning it, it was it was a little scary because it was a completely new thing but it was mostly a really thrilling thing because we were able to, we, we sort of knew right away that we could try almost anything you know we could try things that hadn't been tried before that that template was there when we did the black and white show uh, dream sequence always rings twice ABC originally pleaded with us not to film in black and white to film it in color we'll take the color out and I had enough experience at this point with the network to realize that that was that was a fool's mission so we literally went out and got the old cameras and the old film stock and then discovered there was no lab in Hollywood that would develop it for us. No, nobody wanted to take the liability. Finally, we were able to convince MGM Labs to develop this film in black and white. We put it together, and we knew we really had something special, but ABC was still terribly concerned that we were showing this black and white television show, you know, in 1986. Again, Glenn uh, had so much balls to stand up to the network so many times uh, to protect the show, and and to do things like that because yes it would have been so easy to do it in, in color and then say well we'll take the black and white out later but it doesn't look the same and they felt that like the wizard of oz which was a, a movie that was shown in this country every year and every year they went to great lengths to explain to people the first part is in black and white the second part is in color there's nothing wrong with your television set abc felt it was important for us to offer that kind of assurance to the audience so we thought well who should do this I don't know, again, it just cracked me up, Orson Welles, you know, here's the, the man who probably made the most beautiful black and white film, you know, ever. So I wrote this thing, which he ultimately said, you know, about, you know, very special monochromatic, blah, 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 moonlighting, so get grandma and the kids and lock them in the basement. And it was a pretty funny thing, and I called him up and said, would you be interested in doing this thing? And to my amazement, he said, well, I'll send it over. So I sent it over, and, and he called back and said, I think it's funny. In this age of living color and stereophonic sound, the television show Moonlighting is daring to be different. I met him October 4th, I remember, because it was my mother's birthday. And he passed away October 11th, just exactly one week later. And, you know, we took pictures, and I had my script with me. And I got his autograph, so right where it said, you know, written by in our names, he signed it, and um, I mean, that was just such a thrill. I remember standing on the stage and saying, I'm actually, I'm actually here, and, 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 and that's Orson Welles. And then I, I, I sort of felt something, and I, and I looked around, and the stage had filled with people. Everybody, very reverently, very silently, had just sort of wandered in, standing in the shadows, watching Orson Welles. And, uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. There was something about it. I thought it was very surreal, but most of my experience on Moonlighting was pretty surreal. Don't tell me, the cornet player. The name's Chance. Chance, Cash, Johnny, Brick, Lonesome, Shane, McCoy. You can call me Zach. From the first day of dailies, there was something very special about it. And I think Bruce and Sybil enjoyed very much even that early on in the life of Moonlighting, they enjoyed playing somebody other than Maddie and David. The first one was really the MGM woman in, uh, in jeopardy, being manipulated by the bad man. The camera was, you know, moved with them and kind of danced with them in that, you know, more that MGM classic way. And the second part was the Warner Brothers, 
you know, much Raymond Chandler voiceover. I was the kind of where the guy is really the victim. And it was much more cutty and stylistic and you had the, you know, road signs coming at you. How long was I supposed to walk the streets? How much guilt was I supposed to be feeling? How long were those signs float over my head? So we, you know, we tried to emulate that, and that's, oh, that's always fun. I mean, that's a challenge, to look at something and then copy it, but not make fun of it. We, I think that was, we, it was really homage, not parody. There was a scene in which Bruce is sitting in the window of his hotel room, and he has a sign in the back of him. It's the sign, the neon sign that says hotel, but Glenn had set it up, so it just says hot, and then he's playing his trumpet, but he's faking a number. And I'm thinking, well, now how am I gonna deal with this to make sure that this looks really, really good on camera? So what I did is I used the freeze frame on my VCR, and I did a freeze frame of every one of his valve moves on the trumpet. And I made a chart for myself, and then I figured out every possible note that could be played with every one of those valves and then I composed an original melody that wove its way through that chart so that when the music was played in post score and added to Bruce's picture it would look like he was really really playing a trumpet. I always play my horn with my shirt off late at night by an open window next to a flashing neon light. I know I look good that way. You know, the black and white show, Sybil just looked terrific in that. She, there's this one move that she does where she flips her hair back, and I was going, whoa, that is so sexy. Part of the fun of the dream sequence was, was you know, you got to have these two people kiss without him being a real kiss because they were in the dream sequence. But those were great kisses. It was really a matter of just putting together these great pieces of film that Peter Werner and obviously Glenn's words and the actors gave us. But it was most extraordinary hour of television I've ever worked on. For like two years, it just felt like everything we did was golden. And you gotta give that to Glenn, because you know, it all comes down from that guy. I mean, there were, there were moments in all these things that I just thought, you know, the one that really comes to mind, which I thought was great, was the end of one of the Christmas shows, when they walked off the set and there we all were, you know, singing uh, Noel. I really love that, because I thought, what a cool way to do Christmas. It was so sweet. We just got a call, you know, kind of at the last minute, saying that we're all going to be in the episode and call your spouses and your children, and we're just, we're going to be there and we're going to sing, and they just opened it up, and it was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful moment. So many children and family members. It was remarkable for an, a, dr a dramatic show or comedic show to turn into something that was so touching and moving. It's a memory that uh, I sort of treasure from the show. I think everybody, you know, from that point forward felt, uh, not only mean to be corny, but I, I think a, a little closer. There was a certain feeling in the air that you could almost touch, that it was so tender and so sweet, and we had never had really a uh, a moment like that on the show before, and I just thought there was peace in the world. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas everybody! everybody. Merry Merry Christmas. The School of Moonlighting was, uh, you know, gave me so much uh, experience and confidence, and uh, you know, we just try this and we try that, and the music was great, and the crew was great, and the the script was great, and you just, you know, you just couldn't, you couldn't go far enough. You couldn't try too many things. The audience was with you. It was a great experience. Every day was special. There's small little nuances and you came away and you know, hey, we did good work today. You know, some things are better than others, but every day was good work. And you don't always get that on uh, an episodic show. I would say, and I say this a lot, you know, when I talk about the show, uh, it, the first two years of Moonlighting, I, I would put up against any one hour Two character format that that I've ever seen on TV. I'm glad you're my partner. Partner. 